Hey folks, thanks again for joining. We're gonna play a quick video here. For Peplink, one of our biggest driving things behind our culture is passion. That, that's, you know, anytime we bring somebody onto the team, we gotta find a passion in their lives. We gotta find that that spark that makes them kind of light up and really push harder than, than people normally do. And that's something we look for in our partners, our employees. And again, that's just something that really drives our company. So here's a short little video to show that in action. What does Peplink passion look like in practice? Let's take a look. Big thanks to everyone who helped to make this possible. All right, folks, thanks again for joining. I'm Travis. For those of you that have been on our webinars before, I'm showing my face for the first time as the camera's on webinars. So, hi. I think we got a lot of new people here today, though. There are over 600 people on the line today. I think that's probably a record for the start of a show for Peplink. So, Thanks so much for joining. Everybody is obviously very interested to hear about Peplink and Starlink. Uh, we got a lot of guests today. And, you know, really for Peplink, our whole goal is we want to make it always work. And it is whatever it is that's important to you or your customers. And so in this case, you know, people want to work remotely. They want to go to fun places and do fun things and, you know, maintain their, their lifestyle and be able to work and do the things that they used to do at home out in these awesome new places. And so that's really what I think a lot of people are intrigued by when they hear about Starlink and, and what those capabilities could do for them. I think a lot of people think that that is the, the key and the ticket to enabling that, that mobile lifestyle for them. And so we're gonna dig into that today. We've got five different guests that have utilized Starlink and Peplink in different combinations in different industries. And so we're going to show people in a, you know, in a personal context how you can use Starlink, um, but also in a business context, um, there's lots of different ways that people are using Starlink to support lots of different applications. And so again, we've got people that are out there on the bleeding edge doing this every day. They've been doing it for over a year, some of these people. And you know, Starlink, for most people, hasn't been available for over a year. So we've got some absolute experts to talk to you folks today about what Starlink is, how it's working for them, how they're using it, and how Peplink fits into that, why they have Peplink with the Starlink system that they've been using for all these cool connections. So, you know, I know there's lots of questions out there. Um, we've got, you, you guys did an awesome job. You guys submitted tons of questions for us before this webinar, and I know we won't be able to cover all of those on the webinar, and there will be lots of burning questions that people still want to know the answer to after this webinar is done. We'll try and cover as much as we can online, but we're going to make an effort to just file all those all those questions that you folks submit, and we'll have a follow up document to try and address as many of those questions that we don't get to answer during the live stream. So that'll be a follow up material that we're going to send out afterwards. And so we're going to just try and keep uh, keep you guys informed and keep as many of those questions top of mind and make sure that you're getting the right answers to those so that you can figure out how to solve the problems that you're you're trying to solve. I know a lot of the questions out there is, you know, 
the, the thing that we heard the first from the very get go of Starlink is there's just kind of, you know, at least from our partners, there's some folks kind of like thought Starlink would be a threat to them. Like Starlink would suddenly eliminate the need for a pep link. Now that now that you've got the Starlink, you can go out in the woods and you can get connected anywhere and you don't really need any help anymore. And I think what you'll hear today from our panelists is that's just not quite the case. It's awesome technology that enables all kinds of new things, but there's some gaps there and there's some problems there still. And so that's really where Peplink fits in. Um, but, you know, if if there is a need for that, how do we use it? What What's the best way to use Peplink for, for combining Starlink or, or in enhancing Starlink? How do we use speed fusion and bandwidth bonding? Just how do I configure this? And so we'll dig into some of these best practices, tips and tricks and configurations and just, you know, other kind of, I'd say there's a lot of surprising details that I've learned already in just preparing for this webinar and talking to our panelists. And so I'm gonna just introduce all of our panelists here. I, I could talk all day about this, but these folks have been doing this way more than myself. And so uh, we've got five guests, like I said, from different different industries, different aspects of, of connectivity. And we've got Ozon, he is from the UK. Ozon, uh, why don't you just say hi to everyone, tell us who you are, what company you're with. Just a real quick background on what you do. Hey everybody, uh, it's, uh, my name is uh, Ozan, uh, otherwise known as Ozzy. I'm from a company called Simply Wi-Fi. Uh, um, here in the UK, we specialize in using public inspiring for the events, uh, exhibitions and conferences uh, sector. Okay, excellent. Also with us, we've got Eric, or Eric Johnson from Type 1, or Type X, sorry. Hey guys, yeah, uh, I'm Eric with TypeX. Uh, we're all about digitizing energy at the source. So we deploy mobile data centers uh, in oil fields and essentially we attach our generators to flare gas and just capture that energy. So Starlink has been a game changer for us because most of our sites are completely 100% remote. That's awesome, I'm, I can't wait to dig into that. That sounds really interesting. Steve Mitchell, we've got with us from CBITS. Steve, why don't you say hi to everybody? Yeah, hi there. My name is Steve Mitchell. Uh, I live on a boat and my customers and clients are all on boats as well. So Starlink has been a game changer for us because cellular works when you have sight of land. Um, you know, Starlink has enabled us to be out even further and in deeper places uh, and has really allowed so many more people to work remotely and to uh, take really great vacations while they are also streaming all sorts of fun Netflix shows. So really interested in telling you about our experiences with Starlink and Peplink as well. You can't get behind. That's not acceptable. You got to keep up when you're on. No, nope. binge watching at Anchor is important in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we've got another Eric with us, Eric McCauley. He is the owner of Mobile Must Have. Eric, why don't you say hello? Hey folks, Eric with mobilemusthave.com. Um, I live in an in a in an RV, so a uh, a land yacht, as it were. That uh, large Class A motorhome that was in the Passion video is my home. Uh, we specialize in providing mobile connectivity um, for for mobile users. Um, that that primarily is in the RV and van life space, um, and we're very excited to share our experiences as well. We have a Peplink Starlink solution that's been on our RV for over a year. It's probably on its second or third generation at this point. So we've done a lot of tweaking and excited to tell you guys about it. Great. And last but not least, we have Tyler Blackwell from RDH Partners. Tyler, say hi and tell us what RDH Partners does, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, Tyler Blackwell here with RDH uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, our division, Selbris Communications, works primarily with the film and television industry, uh, broadcast industry. Uh, we use a combination of uh, both cellular as well as now Starlink uh, to allow our customers to uh, communicate at the edge, uh, any everything from video remote video collaboration uh, to remote server access to their data centers. Uh, so very, very complex deployments all the way up to, down to simple deployments, uh, but Starlink has been uh, a great backbone um, to adding on to the capabilities that uh, Peplink and Cellular uh, has given us over the last couple of years. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us and tell your stories today. Again, we just want to tell real stories from the field and and let people understand where the, where the problems are and how they can solve those problems. And so we're going to dig deeper into each one of your guys' stories in a minute here and let people just really understand what it is that you're doing and how you're solving these problems. Um, again, I think we've got a really good variety of, of topics and use cases here between the different industries that all of you folks participate in. So I think it'll be really an interesting show for everybody here that's on. Um, before we dive into all those case studies, I'm just going to give you just a quick background here. When, when, when we're talking about Starlink, uh, for those of you that don't know, Starlink is a satellite technology. It's brand new satellite technology. You know, satellites have been around for forever, but um, Starlink is a new way to use satellites. They're called low Earth orbit. And so it's faster. It's closer to the ground and so latency is much better and so it brings a lot of like wireline properties to a satellite connection that really you know previously had really low really long latency really uh, slow latency and kind of presented some challenges for a lot of different reasons but uh, in any case when you're out on the go there's lots of different ways that you can get connectivity um, you know it could be as simple as a hotspot a wi-fi hotspot right if you're a, a camper and you're at an rv park most of those have some sort of our uh, Wi-Fi hotspot system, some sort of Wi-Fi mesh system, maybe. Um, they may be free, they may be paid. If you're at a marina, again, those often have these, these Wi-Fi systems and they're okay, right? I mean, you might be able to get on and check your email and you might be able to get on and do everything that you need to do. There's just a huge range of quality and, and user experience on those types of, of Wi-Fi systems. But I think for the most part, people's experiences, they're pretty overloaded. They're not that fast. They're not that reliable. And so, again, they're great for, oh, I need to check this thing real quick, but they're not good for doing work almost ever and usually not even sustainable for keeping yourselves entertained uh, for too long. So they're there, but often not a very reliable option. Um, on the other side, we've got 5G or LTE. Um, this is available in a lot of places, of course. It's not available everywhere, though, as you folks that go out into the outskirts know. Uh, signal can drop off pretty quick when you get into some of the more enjoyable areas out in the country. And so, uh, again, it's hard to find the right carrier. You know, there's T-Mobile, there's AT&T, and there's Verizon in the U.S. Uh, pick your country. You've probably got one to three options to choose from in terms of providers, and they've each got their own coverage footprints and their own gaps. And so... You know, this weekend you may be well served by your favorite carrier, but next weekend at a new location you may not be. And so that just presents challenges as you move around is in terms of how many different carriers do I need to subscribe to? You know, with Peplink, we make it easy to combine all those connections, but you still have to go and, and source all those connections. And so that's challenging. But, you know, we've been bringing things like Speed Fusion Connect to try and make that easier for people. But again, all of these technologies have their limits and, you know, you folks push these technologies to their limits more than most people do. And so, you know, that's really where Starlink comes in. Starlink isn't limited by the footprint of a tower on the ground. It can shoot that coverage down from space and cover much wider areas, much bigger geographies. Uh, and with the new lo low Earth orbit technology and other technologies, they're able to do this at um, broadband speeds where before satellites were just, you know, kind of inherently slower at, at, for the most part. So. Again, there's tons of new possibilities here, but um, you know there's drawbacks. Again, coverage is always a guess on the 5G and cellular side. Wi-Fi gets bogged down pretty quick. And with Starlink, there's problems there too. Uh, you need clear sight to the sky. Um, if you're in an area, you know it's not just as simple as looking straight up and finding that little hole in the trees. You need a really wide aperture to the sky to keep that connection as reliable as possible because with Starlink, those satellites are moving constantly. There's just a whole swarm of these satellites that are moving by and floating by you. And that's what provides you that coverage is it just a temporary pass by that, whatever satellites above you at that moment. So you're not looking at just one spot or another spot, it's constantly moving. And so the less view of the sky you have, your uptime is going to go down proportionally. So if you've got just a limited view of the sky, you're not gonna stay connected very long. And you're gonna have a lot of disconnects. If you've got a wide open view of the sky, you're pretty much gonna stay connected all the time. There's still times I think where folks out there will experience those gaps if, if the satellites aren't quite covering uh, seamlessly. But again, if you don't have that, that visibility to the sky, you really don't have much to work with at all. Um, and so RVers especially are finding that there's a, you know, 
people like shade when they're in hot sun and things like that. And that's not necessarily compatible with where you want your Starlink dish to be. So there's lots of considerations there. Speeds can be limited on these mobile plans. We'll get into a lot more details on some of these, these kind of hangups with Starlink. But again, it's great technology. It's awesome. It's amazing, but it's just not perfect. And none of these technologies are. And Peplink is here to add that layer to smooth out those imperfections and give you the best quality video streaming, the best quality Zoom, Teams, Skype, all of those different real-time applications that you folks are trying to do. That's where Peplink comes in. We make those things work every time so that you can take Starlink and you can take cellular or Wi-Fi and get the best of both worlds and back those each, back each other up and smooth out those gaps that each one of them has. And so that's really the story that we're going to let each of our panelists tell you today and just get into the details of how they've done it in their specific situations. So with that, we're going to dive right in here. First up, we've got mobile must-have. So Eric, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you explain what we've got going on in the picture here and just what your experience has been overall with Starlink. And folks, this is going to be an open format, so you can expect I will ask Eric questions. You can expect other panelists to be asking questions. If you want, throw questions in the chat. We'll try and mix some of those in. But um, this is really going to be a discussion, not just a presentation. And so, again, very much welcome questions across the board here. So, Eric. Yeah, thanks, I'll Travis. That's so true. I, I never thought I would become such good friends with my local logger up in New Hampshire because he's been clear cutting trees to get my my <laughs> fixed mounted Starlink. We're not covering right now to work much better on my my rural cabin, but uh, but absolutely, it's 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 definitely why we're you know whether it's Peplink or something else, we've always felt that. WAN aggregation is so important. You have to have one more than one connection to the to the internet. Uh, there's just no one perfect connection, and uh, and you know, Peplink has just been our go-to for ease of use and ability to just add so many connections. So what you got here is some close-up pictures of uh, my setup inside of in, inside of my motorhome, which is a a larger Class A, but uh, you know, this is pretty mix and match with just about any RV. Um, at the heart of our setup, well, let me start a little bit earlier. Basically, what this can do is give me four simultaneous connections uh, with the current setup, and I'll explain the components in a minute. But we have a cellular modem one, a cellular modem two, uh, Starlink, and then we also have a 5G dome uh, HD dome that is pictured in there as well. Now, if we're interested in using Starlink in the dome at the same time, because we are utilizing a Transit Pro, um, we would utilize Starlink on the Wi-Fi WAN source, but that Wi-Fi WAN flexibility allows me to use the WAN wired port for that HD dome and Starlink off Wi-Fi WAN. Um, or we can simply just swap an ethernet cable pretty quickly. That's one of the benefits of utilizing the SpeedFusion Connect is I can have one link go down while I'm swapping it back and forth and it doesn't affect my overall connection as long as I have one of my two primary cellulars up and running. If I utilize Wi-Fi WAN, I can have up to five simultaneous connections up from four because Wi-Fi WAN will go with both the 2.4 and the five gigahertz separately. So there's a lot of WAN flexibility. Uh, the Transit Pro that is featured here, we were really excited about. It replaced our Transit Duo and that gave us uh, a lot of added coverage at a really aggressive price point, um, mainly because of this switch up to the category seven cellular modem that, that is in that device, which gave me access to band 71, the rural band for T-Mobile and really rounded out my cellular coverage. So I have that category seven and category 12 combo uh, device. And then obviously I have the 5G kind of rock star super fast if necessary in the dome to round out that solution. Since I built this, the BR2 has come out, but that's at a higher price point. But for folks that potentially were really interested in uh, ultra fast speeds and not having to swap the WAN cable, the BR2 is kind of the, the way to go because you get the two wired WAN ports. So you could have Starlink in the dome or utilize the USB port on that. That modem is, is a rock star, but it's a bit more, um, price point wise than our average customer. We sell quite a few of those, but but uh, but the transit's kind of our mainstay. Um, yeah, I think for, 
folks yep. that are new to PepLink or just kind of diving into this, we have a lot of different products and a lot of different models. And so the technology is basically the same across all the products. We have Speed Fusion that lets you take more than one connection and put them together in ways that uh, really solves connectivity challenges like, you know, poor audio quality on Zoom or Teams. But uh, Eric's talking about different models that support even more than, you know, several connections. And so I guess, Eric, what do you see when you're out and about? Like how many, you know, you've got a lot of different connections deployed on your on your system. How many do you see actually used at any given location when you go from, you know, one campground to another or as you're moving around? What, what yeah, it's kind of, kind of used? It's, it's kind of interesting because I started looking at my cost per gigabyte and Starlink was by far my highest cost per gigabyte. And the reason for that is because they don't use it very much. Um, the vast, I, I have an 80-20 rule, and I kind of covered this in a personal blog post that I'll, I'll share with folks that has wiring diagrams and stuff like that when we wrap up. But um, when we started doing an analysis over a year of traveling, we were utilizing Starlink 20% of the time and cellular 80% of the time. That was kind of the, the gist of it. Wi-Fi does come into play there, but it's it's pretty minimal. And it's when you're, it, it's become even less so in the, in the in the Starlink era, Wi-Fi is just not necessarily something. I always needed Wi-Fi at a campground when there was no cellular, but now I have Starlink. Um, but it still can come into play. Like you said, I like to park under a tree. <laughs> Shade is nice when it's 95 degrees, and that uh, that amount of sky that you need uh, for Starlink is is quite is quite high. Um, that being said, um, I gladly pay the Starlink fee every month. Um, it tends to be along the Colorado Wiv River, uh, the Southwest, uh, where there are no trees really. Uh, anywhere where I'm in a valley, I, I am loving my Starlink. It is saving mm -hmm. me where cell signal just can't cover, can't get over those mountains. Yep, yeah, doesn't kind of bleed down into those bowls or valleys, like you said, interesting. Yeah. And I think, you know, to kind of, I know there's a lot of folks that want to share, so I'll wrap it up. But I think the real key for me with this, I, I operate this system for work, like what we're doing right now. I'm in the RV right now, having this call via this system. But I have a two-year-old toddler who thankfully is not in the RV right now. But my wife is not technical. She works in human resources. My son just wants to watch Paw Patrol. And as we're driving down the road, the Peplink solution that self-heals and understands how to manage WAN priorities and deal with all of that means that I was able to drive from New Hampshire to Lake Havasu, Arizona with a family behind me and while doing Zoom calls and have zero dropouts in that connection and had zero use of Starlink. I used Starlink once I got there but because it wasn't really a mobile friendly solution, um, I relied heavily on those uh, cellular connections and um, just have had absolutely great success with, with how this is configured to, to give me just total flexibility on the internet connection side. Whatever I need um, will work and whatever is failing or offline simply just goes into disabled status and, and the, the router can kind of keep things going without a lot of direct intervention from my family or me. I think that that auto, that connectivity management piece is a, is a really good one that you brought up and we'll, we'll kind of keep touching on that. But, you know, the main reason here, you need more than one connection is so that you can work. I think that's kind of the short story to all of this is work is the thing that's driving most of us to want to expand our connectivity options because when you sit, I mean, I spend four plus hours a day on live calls. And so if I'm going to try and do that elsewhere, I need four hours of bulletproof reliability, right? I can't have garblies and blocky video and, and those things happening. And so that's why I think all of us on this call are bringing multiple connections to the mix, but doing that is complicated in, in most cases. And so Peplink is what makes that easy, right? You can manage your cost per gig. You can prioritize those links in that order of cost. And then it just does it, right? You just drive you just show up you just park and maybe you have to go put your dish out but you know that's the most work you have to do to really uh you know manage those connections once you've once you've set those up so thank you eric we'll keep digging into yeah, some absolutely if, if anyone just to wrap if anyone is interested in any wiring diagrams that dive deeper into that i have everything up at uh, starlink.mobilemusthave.com
Awesome. All right, Ozan, the floor is yours. Please tell us what we got here. We got some sweet speed tests here. So let us know what you're doing out there with Starlink and Peplink. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, um, so we've been uh, providing connectivity for events for about 10 years. And across that time, we've used pretty much absolutely everything in trying to bring connectivity onto these sites. Uh, but central to that has always been Peplink for us. The ability to be able to aggregate multiple WAN uh, connections together and to be able to um, have these automatically fail over um, and self-heal have been critical for some of these mission critical things. I mean, when you've got 700 plus devices that are all taking payments, um, you know, through a, a 12 hour session, um, and that's the main revenue income for that festival because of their bars and everything else, it's mission critical that these don't go down. What's been a game changer in the past two years for us has been Starlink. Um, We've managed to build systems where we can use multiple Starlink dishes together. Uh, we can bond these dishes together. We can aggregate all the bandwidth that comes through and give us the amount of uptime that's available. Uh, we've done some serious tweaking and some serious um, configuration tests across multiple different peppling devices, uh, which results in some of the speed tests that you can see on the screen now where we're dropping you know, latency times down to as low as seven milliseconds in some cases. Um, you know, it, that's 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 one hundred percent down to uh, Peplink and the uh, the infrastructure that they've allowed us to build through our SD WAN and everything else that goes with it. Um, that ability to control end to end packet uh, uh, direction and and just you know the, the level of detailed control that we can have has been absolutely everything that we could possibly want. So when we talk about bonding, I think this is important to explain to people is kind of a technical detail but it's a technical detail that really matters in in practice um <laughs> you know there, there's there's connect there's lots of routers that have multiple connections or multiple wans and so you know you could take another manufacturer's cellular router and you could plug a couple starlinks in some of those have more than one wan ports and you can do that um but what you get with that is you get what's called load balancing there so they're going to take uh your skype call or your zoom call or your team's call and they're going to they're going to balance that out. They're going to say, okay, this is a team's call. I'm going to put this one on Starlink dish number one. And if that Starlink dish number one has like a, a slow roam or doesn't quite have the right line of sight to the sky, that call is going to get interrupted if that dish has an interruption. It's not going to be able to switch over to that other dish because it's load balanced and it's stuck basically on that first connection that it got sent to. And so that's how most routers work when they use multiple connections. They stick that traffic on one connection or another and you know that's how the internet expects things to work and so it's not a problem necessarily until your connection starts having that problem you lose you don't have that ability to react real time it's only making decisions based on when you started the call not based on now and so with bonding we're doing all of that combination at the packet level and so that's real time Every, every second, every millisecond, we're making new decisions about which dish to use for this packet and that packet. And so how does that, you know, that I, I believe that that capability is very important to what you guys do goes on, but you know, how does that translate into the difference between solving a problem and not solving a problem? I mean, the way that we have the system set up specifically with Starlink, I mean, you know, normally we deploy uh, our systems with two or three Starlinks. We have got as big as eight. Um, it's been, uh, challenging but the fact that we've got these systems built into peplink where we can uh, you know uh, uh, take multiple connections and uh, build them in such a way where they become resilient where they become uh, we have much much more bandwidth available to us to be able to do things that we wouldn't quite normally be able to do in the middle of a field in the middle of some rural county somewhere in the uk um has just made things so much better i mean the way that i normally explain uh, load balancing to people is that your internet connection is only as fast as your slowest connection um and you can quite easily overload those connections very very quickly but the way that the uh the peplink um system takes all these connections, aggregates the bandwidth together and gives you so much more, means that you've got so much more scope to be able to push 
more services down. So in this particular slide, we were running, you know, we had 750 devices connected. We had CCTV, we had telephones running, we had multiple Wi-Fi networks, and all of this was running, you know, with an attendance of over 30,000 people. The reason that we chose Starlink in this particular case was um, there were quite significant power lines that run through the middle of this site, which was providing significant interruption with 4 and 5G. Um, so Starlink was the only option for us to be able to pull off this event. Um, and it worked flawlessly. We didn't have any issues. You know, when there were slight wobbles on the Starlink system, the PetLink just sorted it out for us. It just balanced it all out, smoothed out those connections. Nobody was none the wiser of anything going on. And, and that's why we've gone down this road. And that's why we standardize everything that we do on a public device. Yeah, to, to me, it's about that user experience, right? You, you know, like you said, if, if you've got little hiccups and skips on this dish or that dish, traditionally, some percentage of your users would feel that, right? You'd have 20% of your users or whatever percent were on that connection would feel that and they would experience that problem. And the other ones maybe wouldn't, but that's what Speed Fusion does differently is we let all of those users continue to have a good experience by dynamically shifting those connections back and forth. And that's a unique technology. That's something, again, other cellular routers can't do. And it's something that enterprises pay, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for other technologies that do similar things. And so Peplink gives you that experience at a much lower cost of ownership. And it's really starting to turn heads in the enterprise space in terms of how they're deploying Starlink to. There's some really uh, big name deployments out there happening that we're not really able to publicly disclose, but um, again, this speed fusion technology is just unique. It's not normal for end users like RVers to be able to purchase technology that does these kinds of things. That's not something that's been accessible to an end user before. And, you know, it may seem expensive to, to folks that are in an RV, but, you know, these are things that cost 50 to a hundred thousand dollars for, for enterprises to do these same things. And so that's, that's what speed fusion is really doing is making this technology accessible to everybody. Just like, just like Starlink has done with satellite connectivity. Satellite connectivity used to only be reserved for the super rich because it was just not affordable at all. And so Starlink has expanded that audience dramatically. And it's the same thing that Peplink is doing with Speed Fusion. We're making that audience of people that can actually afford and, and take advantage of this technology much, much wider. And so uh, with that, and Travis, Steve, one, one other quick thing on that that's so yeah. key. We had... We, I filmed a video and it was kind of so light, I had to add it to another video because there wasn't enough content. It took us less than three minutes to configure Speed Fusion Connect with the new interface. <laughs> it's like five clicks. Uh -huh. Anyone can do it. That is so key. It's not only is it inexpensive, it's easy. Yeah, and that, you know, you, I can't, I'm glad you brought that up because I should not overlook that piece because yeah, this, this is technology that people are paying, you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollars for, and they're paying very, very skilled senior network engineers multi six figure salaries to configure these things, and we, we've kind of avoided the need for that part of it too. I'm not saying don't have good network people, but you don't need good network people if it's just for you or or your bus or your your boat. It's uh, it's not that hard. It really isn't, and we're trying to make it as easy as we possibly can. So. Again, Steve, I'll, I'll let you talk about how you've used this technology in, in your situation. Yeah, thanks, uh, Travis. So um, I live on a boat, but also uh, the folks that I work with most of the time um, also either live on their boats or spend a, a lot of time uh, on their boat as well. Um, and the challenge with the boat is, is similar to an RV. Um, you know, it's a, it's a mobile platform. We're out and about. We have limited power uh, in, in many cases. Uh, but for a boat, if you're using it the, the right way, in my opinion, which is at anchor and out enjoying yourself, you're always moving, even when you're stopped, right? So when you're at anchor, you're slowly rotating, you're moving around. And cellular has been our go-to for ages, um, mainly because you, know, it, you can maintain that connection uh, when you're moving around slowly, um, hopefully. A lot of the time there's challenges with that as well. And the satellite market for boats has been pretty well established as well uh, for a long time. But the, the costs of that are, are absolutely uh, atrocious when it comes to 
installation ranging from you know fifteen thousand to thirty thousand dollars for a single unit and three to ten thousand dollars a month just things that recreational boaters or folks that um, you know aren't independently wealthy <laughs> can't can't afford um so cellular has been our go-to but starlink has really really changed that um quite a bit for us uh in 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 the short term um, the 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 problem for us is that, like I said, we we keep moving all the time. Um, even when we're at a dock, you know, we're moving up and down with the tides. So there's kind of two areas that Peplink has really always been key for us, and it's the same with Starlink. One is which everyone else has talked about: multiple internet connections. You absolutely need, you know, multiple connections, and you need some way of dealing with that intelligently. Um, you know, I see plenty of people using Starlink standalone and then a cellular thing standalone. And half the time, you know, different people on the boat are switching between Wi-Fi networks. It's just not usable. And, and uh, you have to know which one's working at what time. So, you know, having that multiple connections, but also the way that it's dealt with and speed fusion, which we've talked about off and on throughout the presentation today is an absolute game changer for us. You can throw all the connections into, uh, you know, a speed fusion connect setup um, and then really set it and forget it. Uh, so when you leave the dock, you know, you disconnect from the dock Wi-Fi when you're out cruising around cellular is up and running and Starlink is down. When you're at anchor, as you rotate around, different things come and go. I mean, it's it's an absolute game changer when it comes to not having to mess around with things constantly, which on a boat, you already have, you know, the threat of sinking, catching on fire uh, and all those other great things. So you've got your mind pretty occupied. And the last thing you want to do is is mess around with your Internet. So having those multiple connections is, is key and Starlink being one of those tools that we can use um, whether you're you know at anchor or at the dock and then the other piece that that all kind of flows into that's super critical is the prioritization control um, and optimization right so because you're on a boat and you're out in the middle of nowhere your cell connection may not be as good as these cell connections look here on the slide so using the technology in Peplink specifically, like with Speed Fusion um, and some of the different properties that you can kind of delve deeper into will really help make sure that you're always connected all the time. So my setups have been all kind of around testing um, Starlink combined with everything else. I'm currently using two Starlink antennas, uh, one with an RV plan and one with a, a residential plan wildly different results from both of those. Uh, and then in the marine world, we tend to uh, chop our antennas and break things a lot to try to get them to work in an environment that they were never really meant to to, to work. So um, the antennas are also flat mounted, which gives them a lot better performance as well. So um, lots of different combos of things all to try to stay connected while you're enjoying a Mai Tai at anchor and also working and working is in air quotes. <laughs> I, I think for me, one of my favorite things that I've picked up on just watching Starlink develop and unfold is just how enthusiastically people are hardware hacking these dishes. I mean, like, you know, just disabling the motors. It, there's just so many science projects going on out there to try and just really unpack this technology and figure out what can be done to improve and, and work around little little things like that. And so you know, I think that's one of the, the best examples of just absolute creativity and work there is just combining multiple dishes, disabling motors, and, and just kind of like changing the properties of how it works a little bit. It'll be interesting to see how these uh, strategies evolve and, and what, you know, official solutions may come out to, as a result of these as well. The other uh, popular you know, one is DC power too, right? Which you've oh, played yeah, around yeah. with Travis and Eric has got stuff in his site um, that can help you kind of navigate through that as well. Um, and there's little small product offerings that have popped up from folks to, to help you convert it to DC. Although, you know, that can be a, a limit limiting factor if you, if you're not super technical. And of course you've got all sorts of warranty issues there, but for folks on boats in particular, and I know this has to be similar for the RV side of things, especially sailboats, power is a factor, you know, and if you don't have to run that that additional Wi-Fi router and you can connect it into a Peplink device that draws a heck of a lot less power, but gives you all this flexibility, 
um, you know, that kind of hacking I'm all for. So, yeah. And that, that's one thing that I think can be challenging for people too, is I'm glad you said it is power. You know, these Starlink dishes are, are, are thirsty. They want high wattage power. They're, they're, they take a lot of power to run them. And um, that's challenging in a mobile environment, especially when you're in a remote location. So yeah, DC power inverters, or, there's lots of different ways that people are powering these things in mobile situations and, you know, with varying uh, success and varying risks and, um, you know, varying results too. Um, cool. Well, we're going to move over to Eric Johnson from Type X. And talk about a more industrial energy industry focused use of Starlink and Peplink. So, Eric, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you talk about some of the pictures we've got up here. Sure. So, uh, speaking of DC power, uh, we run all of our Starlinks on DC. If you look up at that picture in the top left there, you can kind of see what's going on. We've got a small battery system, some micro tick switches and if you can sneak in the way back there you'll see the balance 20x but um boy i can't talk or rave enough about the balance 20x especially at the price point a gigabit throughput router that has speed fusion cell router or cell modem just an amazing product yeah i guess talk about a little bit about what we do is we have containers throughout north dakota and montana that are on active gas sites and these sites essentially are extracting oil from the ground, but they have no pipeline to get rid of the methane, uh, the propane, any of the other gases that are leaking. So what their current solution is to just burn it off. So there's literally unlimited energy potential out here. And that's what we're doing. We are hosting mobile data centers that mine Bitcoin. And if you have any knowledge of mining, you know that you need 100% uptime. If these miners are not submitting to their pool or to their shares, they're not making money. And if they're not making money, then your clients get mad. <laughs> and so Speed Fusion and Starlink have just been an absolute game changer here. We can take that Starlink, run the priority of our traffic over it because we know it's gonna be up 99% of the time. And bandwidth isn't really a concern for us. We really just care about that latency and uptime. And if for some reason we lose view of the satellite, the Balance 20X has that Verizon SIM in it and instantly fails over. Just an incredible solution. And so your miners don't go offline if you switch from Starlink to, to Verizon. They they stay up, they, they keep hashing. and Exactly, they don't care. And the wow. big thing that this that Speed, Speed Fusion has enabled us to do is before each container is essentially needed its own little computer in it, um, whether that computer was monitoring the miners or doing the VPN. Well, we don't need that anymore. Now we can run all those servers in the cloud. I can maintain everything from my bedroom. We don't have to roll a truck if a Raspberry Pi goes down. I mean, this is just gonna save us an incredible amount of money. And it, I'm guessing being that these are in the middle of North Dakota, these are not easy places to get to, not short drives, not uh, not good cell exactly. coverage probably either, but. Yeah, I mean, the nearest site is two hours away and then most sites are gonna be at least a half hour from each other. And if anybody has ever lived up here, driving around in the winter is not fun. I know how that goes. I, I know your pain there, Eric. Yeah, I mean, this is just cool in, in a lot of ways, right? I mean, number one, I think just forget Peplink and Starlink. What you guys are doing is awesome, right? You're taking free energy, right? You're, you're taking pollution and you're converting it into actual dollars that can be used. And I think that just in itself is fascinating, but it's, I think these technologies that make that a lot more possible and a lot more viable, being able to get that connectivity out in these far-flung places again, right? That They don't have infrastructure out here because they're not in popular areas. And so being able to bring this connectivity out there and make that re reliable makes, I, to me, I think probably makes it a much more viable business for, for folks like yourselves. Absolutely. Well, excellent. We're going to move over to Tyler with RDH. Last but not least, Tyler, you've got some pretty awesome stuff here on, on your pictures. And I just, I love, I love what you guys do overall, but I'll let you kind of take over and tell us what, what the heck we got going on here. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, what you've got here on the on the picture on the left is actually a 
an expo uh, for our industry. Again, we work primarily with the film and television industry uh, here in the state of Georgia. Uh, but we had a, a couple of our, our systems on display for, for the folks to be able to learn more about of our, our, our services and solutions. Uh, and, and what we do, you know, specifically after the, the pandemic is our industry has become very uh, reliant on remote collaboration uh, and communication. Uh, the pandemic put our industry into a very interesting place, uh, trying to get back online, allowing less people to be on set uh, and on the production locations uh, and being able to still uh, collaborate and have their uh, real time input. Uh, but be in safer locations as you know their house or studio environment. And so what that pushed us to do is create solutions where we're creating, we're standing up networks and we're tearing them down either on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly, because what this industry is, is, is we're just a traveling circus. Uh, and that those are the uh, so we provide we provide internet to the to the circus. Uh, what the, the unit, the, the, the tallest unit you see in the photo there uh, is an aerial man lift that we use uh, to be able to get not only uh, the maritime antenna, we use the same maritime antennas that Steve uses, uh, bonding those four connections uh, up in the sky, but also being able to bring Starlink up into the air. Because uh, you talked about at the beginning of your presentation about how uh, you know, if you want to stay in under the shade and under the trees, Starlink's not that great of a solution then. Uh, but for us, you know, the kind of the same caveat of, of cellular, especially in the state of Georgia, uh, the you, geographical changes as well as vegeta thick vegetation create that cell loss that you get the further away you are from a cell tower. Mm -hmm. So our solution is to be able to get up in the air, be able to get as clear line of sight, not only to the cell towers, but also as much, like you mentioned, as much aperture to the sky as possible. Uh, so that's that's the kind of solutions that we're providing. We also uh, are kind of stacked in with it, uh, if you can see the separation, is uh, a light towers. Uh, so we've been converting light towers to be able to provide cellular to what we call base camps. Uh, so we're create, we're not only providing light to the to the base camps, but also providing Wi-Fi. And where Starlink comes into play with that is some of these base camps are getting deployed in you know large farms uh, way out in in eastern or southern Georgia or you know not where there's a lot of metropolitan cellular communication far away from interstates and so we still use peplink to be able to create these complex deployments we've got a lot of access points a lot of routing and switching that are going on to these uh, ruggedized deployments but we still need to be able to provide that network and that's where starlink comes into play being able to uh, allow the remote management to be able to allow the point-to-point -point networks because some customers uh, we have permanent head-end devices in their data centers and we're allowed we're able to with Peplink, be able to create those point-to-point -point networks and allow them to reach out into the edge as if they were working at, you know, the, we've got visual effects artists that are able to work in their trailers, but able to connect to servers uh, back in the uh, studio's data centers uh, and be able to access that equipment. And we're not, in some of those situations, not doing it over cellular because we don't have that access and they need that extra throughput. So that's where Starlink comes into play as well when when combined with Peplink. And, you wouldn't we wouldn't be able to do that with with any other uh, any other pro provider. I just want to like stress the the gravity of like the networks you guys are building out in these remote areas too. Like this isn't just like a pop up like you know like oh we're gonna get ten people on a hotspot. You guys are building like multi gig video production workstation grade networks. Like so there there are I mean it's just it's really mind boggling the the level of network connectivity that you're building out in the middle of nowhere for you know what really is just a temporary use but um it's just kind of fascinating to me to see like really high grade enterprise networking being done from scratch out in the out in the middle of a field it's pretty cool stuff yeah it's it's exciting and uh, it was actually when we were talking with these other the other panelists uh, a couple of days ago you know, we've with the Starlinks, what we've been able to to bond is uh, four on a unit, uh, and then bonding two different separate batches of four together to be able to to make eight. Uh, and but uh, one of our 
first deployments, one of the most complex ones we had deployed, and we've done it a couple of times since then, was creating a one gig network over cellular. Uh, we, we partnered and that project was deployed in, in less than 12 days. Uh, and we pushed 3.8 terabytes of data per day over that network. Uh, but that was a very complex deployment from a cellular standpoint, the amount of antennas required, the amount of cabling, the amount of infrastructure. Uh, and the, the, what's great about Starlink is we're able to now get some up to the same megabit throughputs that we were getting over cellular and being able to deploy it much faster but still have the same uh, ability to have complex and powerful deployments that have a lot of security requirements, uh, a lot of network um, complexity, but also easily to, to deploy and configure uh, in the field quickly with Peplink. Uh, and what mentioned what we what you had mentioned uh, was the EPX, uh, and that's something that we're actually very interested to now take as many Starlinks as we can put on that device and see how fast of a network we can create out in the field. Uh, so it's just, it's it's really exciting um, to see what's possible to be built and, and pushing the envelope of of combining cellular and uh, and satellite with Peplink. Very cool. Yeah, and I think, I think it's really important to point out to people, you know, we've got five experts here that are doing all kinds of different things for all kinds of different people. And so you, we're showing you, I think, what's maybe to a lot of people maybe really complex setups or, or large scale setups. And so, like I said at the beginning, Peplink has a lot of different products, a lot of different options, and they all have this capability inside of them called Speed Fusion. And so you don't have to go nearly as far as these folks are to solve your problem, right? Your problem might not be as big as these folks' problem. So you can take you know, like Eric showed with that Balance 20X, that's a very, you know, that, that device costs less than $500. It's got the cellular built in. So that's a, you know, a, a much more approachable device for somebody who had, just wants their Zoom to work better, wants their teams to work better, right? You don't have to go five cellular and eight satellites and all these different things, right? You can get some of these benefits with much more approachable solutions as well. But there's that ladder of sophistication that you can climb up if you've got bigger, harder, more complex challenges that you need to solve as well. So you've got access to both both sides with Peplink. We make it easy, but we've got the equipment that can handle the much more complicated scenarios. And so um, it's it's really relevant for you know just about anybody that needs better mobile connectivity. It's not just for these super complex, unique applications. There's a whole spectrum of ways that people can do this. Um, I'm going to show you folks just one one more case study real quick, and then we'll just start diving into some questions and, and we'll, we'll hang on. I know we're just a few minutes left on the scheduled window here. If panelists can stay on, that's great. If they have to drop, uh, that's fine too, but I'll hang on for a little while and try and just plow through some questions here. But this last one, we've got a picture. Uh, this was me. Well, that picture is not me, but I took the picture. Uh, last weekend, we were out with Subaru Motorsports. Uh, they were wrapping up their rally season last weekend in Marquette, Michigan, and they had the Lake Superior Performance Rally. And as with all rally races, for those who know, these are far flung locations, the worst of the worst in terms of connectivity. We are just in the middle of the forest, in the middle of nowhere in Michigan. And, you know, you can see we've got the, the maritime antennas there on a case. You can't see the case awesome in that picture, but um, you know, we had we had connectivity to one cell carrier. We had a bar or two from one carrier, but you know, that's just not enough to upload. We had, we, we did a, a three minute inter interview at, at the at the finale of this stage with uh, Brandon Semenek, the, the, the driver who actually ended up winning the championship that day. But um, we recorded an interview with him and it was 500 megabyte file. I mean, it's a big file and you're not gonna upload that with one bar, right? They were doing a live broadcast at that moment and we needed to get this footage back to the, back to the production bus so that they could get that clip on air during the show. And again, one bar, 500 megabyte file, that would have taken two hours probably to do that. And so in this case, we had to rely on the Starlink and we didn't have time to test all the connections and figure out which one worked. We just showed up, we plugged everything up, we stood the tripod up and we got that video uploaded and it got into the live broadcast right away. And so we didn't have to think about it, right? We planned for it, we, we were ready for it, but when we were there, we didn't know exactly what we were going to be dealt with. And so 
I mean, we had five minutes to get there and get set up. We, we literally just about missed the interview because this was such a hard to get to location. And we didn't miss the interview, right? It just worked. We plugged it in, we turned it on and we got it and we sent it and, and it worked great. And so, again, those are the things that we're able to make easy for you so that you don't need IT people out in the field. You don't have to think about it after it's done. You just let it work and go about your go about your job. And so that was just really fun for me to see firsthand and experience that because it's stressful. I mean, in, in their environment, it's now. It's now or it's or or you missed it. And that's, that's all there is. There's no second chance on them for them. And I think that's the case for a lot of people trying to do things in very remote areas. It just has to work every time. So, like I said, thank you so much. We've got, uh, that brings us to the end of this. I'm going to stay on here and plow through some questions. And then after the webinar is done, everybody who registered will get a an email with a link to this presentation, to the recording of it. So they can, you can watch it offline go back and review it. And then again, it might take us a week to get uh, the question summary published, but we will also distribute that via email to you folks. So again, I'll answer some questions now. Um, I'm gonna just first off though, just invite the panelists. Um, again, a lot of people have asked about settings, you know, so how are you configuring Speed Fusion to work with Starlink? Um, are you doing it to bond multiple Starlinks? Are you doing it to combine Starlink with other technologies? Um, Anybody out there on the on the panel can just kind of chime in, but yeah, how are you configuring your speed fusion tunnels to make this work the best possible? And I mean, I can jump in if nobody else is going to talk. Um, at least on the on the boating side of the world, few people have more than one Starlink. Some people do, I do, but most people have a single Starlink, and it's meant to supplement what they already have, right? Cellular and other things. So. <clears throat> Speed fusion, um, you know, obviously is critical in that situation. Uh, for in terms of settings, uh, we go in and at least uh, turn on WAN smoothing uh, for sure. Uh, we put that usually for most people. The reason they're using it, or the the reason they they have these requirements, is that they're working remotely, right? So they're doing video, they're doing Teams and Zoom, like we're doing today. They're doing other things that are sensitive to latency and packet loss. So we go in and turn on uh, WAN smoothing, forward error correction. Uh, WAN smoothing, we put in the normal level for both of those options. For forward error correction, we're using low. Uh, and then for traffic distribution, we use the dynamic weighted bonding, and we do turn on low for congestion latency level. All that tech speak basically means... Um, we're trying to 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 monitor the connection beyond just using multiple connections for those who've never really played around with speed fusion. We're trying to use some of that special sauce that Peplic has in speed fusion to monitor things like packet loss, latency, the quality of the connection. Um, it does cost more uh, in terms of your bandwidth um, and 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 usage because it's sending out duplicates of traffic over certain things. But most of our customers would prefer that so that if they do lose a link or when they do lose a link, because it happens all the time, that their video sessions are uninterrupted. So that's that's where we focus things. There's a lot of other basic options that we turn on, but those are the, the pretty key areas, um, WAN smoothing, air correction, and then some congestion stuff. Yeah, I think WAN smoothing is a good one to just I'll over give people an overview. Um, you know, these are unpredictable, non-guaranteed, what we call best effort links, right? Starlink is not guaranteed. Cellular is not guaranteed. There is no SLA for those of you in the enterprise world, service level agreement. If you're buying enterprise connectivity, it comes with some sort of percentage of uptime. They're guaranteeing that you're going to see 99.99 .99 or some sort of guarantee of what your consistency should be like. And those are just not things that come with cellular or any of any wireless connection, basically. And so people want that because they want their applications to work that reliably, right? When you, you want 100% of your business calls to be usable and, and able to communicate. And so that's what we're doing is we're, we're basically brute forcing our way into that guarantee. We're not able to guarantee it in a true sense, but we utilize those multiple connections in a strategy that assumes one or the other will fail. So WAN smoothing sends multiple copies of your, your team's call out so that as 
a cellular link or Starlink has an interruption, that other connection is already sent a copy to back that up. So there is no loss in video because it came in from the other connection and not the 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 one that maybe had an issue. And so that's what that's what WAN smoothing does is it doubles the traffic, which doubles your usage, but it gives you a much better chance at avoiding those 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 painful issues of packet loss and jitter and um, high latency that that you might experience and really ruin your Zoom or Teams call otherwise. So it's it's just a strategy to give you that SLA type of experience on these non-guaranteed links. I think Travis, one of the other great things you guys have is that option to have multiple tunnels. So mm -hmm. we've set up customers where they have an SSID that says, you know, dash WS for WAN smoothing. And we're like, don't use that unless it's your Zoom call. And then they just move between their Wi-Fi networks mm -hmm. uh, depending on the the uptime requirements and the amount of bandwidth they have available. The other yeah. comment um the dynamic weighted bonding i think has been it's like a hidden gem in the settings that i don't think a lot of folks understand or know is there and that's inside of the uh the the primary tunnel settings and that that's magic. really that's benefits awesome. yeah it, it's because the whole sd wan concept was you know oh i've got two dsls they're basically identical and that's how it's going to operate and the uh the dynamic weighted bonding just does such a great job when your links are 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 diverse and do not have the same upload and download speeds. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Dynamic weighted bonding is just a another mode of speed fusion that you can set. And like you said, Eric, you can, you don't have to pick one of these modes, right? You can configure your speed fusion connect so that you've got a WAN smoothing mode and you've got a bonding mode. And like you know, like with Subaru as an example they've got situations where they're doing a live stream directly from their phone to Facebook or Instagram live or YouTube live. And so that's a streaming application, right? They need that consistency. They don't need hundred megabits per second to stream. They need one megabit per second all the time. Right. But again, sometimes they're recording a video and then uploading that to a production stack. And that's a different way to send video. So they're trying in that use case, they need the speed. They want that 100 megabits so that they can shuttle that video up. It doesn't need to be consistent because it can just retransmit something. It doesn't have to be real time when you're uploading like that. So they also have two different SSIDs so that they can best adapt to those two different use cases as they're in different locations. And yeah, it's for them, it's just telling their media guy or girl, switch from the streaming SSID to the internet SSID. That's all they have to do. They don't have to be technical people. They just have to pay attention to which network they're on and that's all they got to do. Any other best practices out there in terms of configurations or settings that other folks have experienced or, or tested with? I know we've got... Um, you know, there, again, there's different ways that people are doing this. There's some, you know, I know we've got one deployment. It's uh, definitely a high visibility one, but it, it's, a, it's a ship and it's completely away from cellular coverage most of its time at sea. And so satellite or, you know, cellular just isn't that useful to that ship. And so in their, in their use case, they're bonding over 10 dishes. So they're taking over 10 Starlink dishes and they're smashing all that bandwidth together because there's just a lot of people on, on these boats. And you know, for them, they have to use that dynamic weighted bonding, even though they are all the same dish. Each dish at any given moment is getting different throughput, different latency, different packet loss. And so dealing with all those different variations is really what dynamic weighted bonding was designed to do. Like, like you said, Eric, is use those kind of asymmetric connections and make that a really clean, consistent experience and efficiently get that bandwidth out of those different connections as they kind of go up and down and capacity. Um, so that's something we developed over the last two years. It's, you know, we just never stop, right? We're not ever satisfied with what we're able to do with speed fusion. And, you know, with Starlink, there's more room for improvement there too. We're gonna, we're continuing to eke out performance and efficiency when we're bonding Starlink plus Starlink, Starlink plus cellular. There's lots more that we're working on to just further improve that, that speed fusion capability and efficiency. Yeah, and thank you again for not only this, but just the unified operating system across all of the devices is, is at least for someone who has to support it, but also for the average 
customer who has to utilize these devices is just, it really helps us, uh, you know, deploy these and ensure that they're working reliable. Just that everything has the same operating system has been great. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people ask about the dish hardware. What generations and what plans are you folks using when you're setting this up for customers? What what are you folks finding works well and is kind of worth the money? Uh, I've got all of the versions, but I wouldn't recommend most of them. Um, the Maritime one is an absolute, I mean, unless you're independently wealthy, I can't afford $5,000 a month for the service. It's a great solution, um, but at least for boaters, uh, I don't know that that's really... <laughs> Uh, that's really an option. I know for some of the other guys on the call, there's options um, from the, or some of those, the residential, sorry, the business and the maritime versions are are great um, for the commercial side. But at least for the boating world, the RV plan is probably the most popular. Um, it's got limitations in terms of being rate limited when you're in different places, but either that or the residential option seem to be the most popular from, from the monetary perspective. When you get into the business plans, at least for uh, boats, you know, smaller than 100 feet, uh, that gets a little difficult to, um, just because you're trying to sell them a whole package with the Starlink side, with the Peplink side, Wi-Fi, marine antennas, and you can quickly get, you know, beyond $10,000, $10, which can be um, a little bit of a price point challenge for some folks on the boating side. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we, have a, we have a business dish that is the $500 a month or so business plan. Uh, and at least in Southern New Hampshire, the performance on that dish is not uh, showing numbers that are, in, that, that are greatly in excess of another one we have that's on the RV plan. So even though the dish is about twice the size and it, it has higher speed uh, caps, we do see some minor changes, but it's, it's not like four times the speed. But, but that could be very much location dependent, but it's just a piece mm -hmm. of information. Oh, and I can I can second what Aaron mentioned. Eric mentioned is, you know, the the enterprise dishes don't really step much above the uh, the RV deployment. Now, if you're worried about the legalese uh, and everything that they have to say in the fine print of your your use cases and and how you're deploying it, uh, then absolutely take a deep read. Uh, but as we've I think a lot of us has mentioned, uh, we're chopping these things up and and trying to see what we can. Uh, what next level we can take them to. Uh, and RV is the, has been the most cost effective. Tyler, in, in terms of what you're talking about in uh, the legal ease side, are you talking specifically just the business versus personal use? Yeah, correct. If yeah. you're applying a business, if you're applying for right. a business use, yeah. but you don't want to spend the business price, uh, the RV <laughs> is going to get you very close to the same performance. Yeah, I think on the legal side, I always the the question, and I saw it a couple times in the Q and A too, is can we use the RV plan underway? You know that sort of thing. Technically, you're not supposed to. We know there's lots of people that are, but that's I think the one thing that uh, that I've struggled with 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 Starlink is just the constant landscape that's changing, which is a perfect reason why you need other things involved to make sure you're always connected. Right? That. I've, we have to remember, or I oftentimes have to remember that it's only been, what, five, six months since we've been able to use this stuff, like, reliably. Before then, yeah. there were so many restrictions in place, it wasn't even a viable option. And what what's it going to be like next year, right? So it's it's a constantly exactly. changing landscape. Well, yeah. and I can say that not, not a single one of our deployments has it just been Starlink only. Uh, Starlink is always there to supplement what we're deploying from a cellular standpoint as a end all be all yeah and i think you know in some cases you know starlink might be the only connection you could conceivably get right that that's definitely a possibility because of the technology and its capabilities but in those situations if you're bonding you know 10 or more dishes even you're still relying on one set of infrastructure in the background and so you're still susceptible to a complete outage if you know even if it's multiple connections to that one provider that one provider can have a bad day and they will, you know, frankly, they will. Every provider does. I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody, but that's the reality of of staying connected is. If it is your only connection, you, you don't have the remote capability, remote control capability, being able to get uh, into the device if you weren't there. Whereas if you're putting a PEP link in line with that solution, you can. 
mm -hmm. uh, via, you know, via in control now via in touch, you know, and, and add, you know, we're exploring our ways into that in new abilities of being able to ha be able to reach our hands into any IP device possible. I mean, it's just, a, it, that's a great feature um, to, to come from the, the IC2 side. Uh, and if you have only just one Starlink, you still have all of those abilities by adding a peplink in line. That, that's a good point. And in, in, I mean, in touch isn't directly related to Starlink here, but like you said, operationally, when you're able to extend connectivity into those new areas, that means you're able to extend your entire operation in there and configure those remote encoders or IP phones or, you know, those other servers that might be at those locations. Once, once you get that pipe, you've got all these tools available to start using and uh, leveraging that. So yeah, that, that's a good point, Tyler. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, one question here from the from the group is speed fusion application aware, for example, recognize which applications need bandwidth versus low latency. Yes. Um, and that's a great question because, you know, we've talked about like, oh, I've got a streaming SSID and then I've got, uh, you know, an upload SSID. And that's one way to do it for sure. The other way to do it is to map your applications to those policies. So you only need one SSID and it will just say, hey, Zoom, you go on the WAN smoothing policy and uh, Facebook, you go out the bonding policy and, you know, it, you can definitely do it that way. The only real catch to that is you have to be very confident that you know all of the applications that you may need to use those technologies with. So, you know, if you're going to use a new social platform, you have to have a policy for that social platform in place before you start streaming so that you catch that traffic. Um, so it can get a little bit tricky that way, but, you know, for some of you, you're just using Teams and, that's all you need to do. And yeah, you can just map teams right to that WAN smoothing profile. That's exactly how I have my setup configured right now as we're talking. I automatically send teams and Zoom to a WAN smoothing profile. And then I've got um, just my bulk internet traffic goes to a, a hot failover profile. So I'm just using my landline and not using any metered cellular ba bandwidth on on my day-to-day -day normal internet traffic, but I'm always using cellular to back up my Zoom and Teams calls. And I don't have to think about that. I don't have to switch networks. So I've used that, um, that application policy instead of different SSIDs. But again, there's just different ways to do this for different users, different use cases. So you don't have to do it the application way, you can do it the SSID way or, or vice versa. So we try to make it easy and flexible for people. Um, I think one other thing that I just want to kind of talk about real quick is just I, I'm just amazed with with Starlink and 5G. I think it's so powerful that they're coming out and kind of taking shape right at the same time, because this really gives enterprise everybody really um, just brand new options for creating really, really robust networks. Right. If you're able to combine 5G and Starlink you don't have any wires coming into your facility, right? There's no lines to get cut. I mean, of course, those towers have lines and the Starlink feeds back to a ground station somewhere, but you've taken, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of miles of susceptible cable that could get, you know, broken, stepped on, crashed into whatever. And you've taken that out of, out of your mix, out of your path. And so you're just getting much more chances of, of reliable fast connectivity when you combine these two connections and yeah it just it really opens up possibilities that were only possible with dedicated enterprise guaranteed circuits not that many years ago and yeah it's going to really just change what anybody is able to do out in the field now so it's going to be really exciting to see how people use this technology now that they're kind of learning and, and aware of what they can do with it Okay, so I'm going to just scan the questions real quick here, but I think we'll probably wrap up. Um, again, we will go through this list and answer a whole bunch of these questions. I'm not ignoring them. We want to make sure that you folks get answers. There's so many things we could talk about. We, we could talk about Starlink and Peplink all day long. We could have an hour long deep dive just on configuring Starlink. I mean, there's so many different places we could dive into. And so we're going to try and give you as many of these answers offline as we can. But Thank you all so much for joining. Again, this is just awesome attendance panel. Thank you, everybody. Give your panel a big round of applause. They're awesome. They spent their time here and they shared a lot of secrets, right? They're, 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 this is their business and they're telling you how they're doing this. And so I, I think that's just tremendously valuable. And it's just a great example of 
just the Peplink community and, and our spirit overall. This is uh this is very normal for our community to sit here with each other and share stories and trade ideas and and let everybody kind of learn together because we're doing new big things that just other people aren't doing out there. And so uh, as we all learn how to do this better, we're all winning and, and able to solve these problems faster with each other. So panel again, thank you so much. Well, I say right, it every folks. day, we wouldn't be able to be where we are without PipLink and your guys' support. So we appreciate it. Absolutely agree to that. And thanks for putting this together, Travis. Absolutely. Yeah, we've we've just got an awesome team. I mean, our marketing team makes so much great content. Our engineers make this stuff possible. And so it's fun to just get everybody together and let the stories get told. So thanks again, folks. Have a great day. And you can see, expect updates from us on the recording of this. And again, hopefully in a week, we'll get some follow-ups on all these different questions you guys have put out there. So thanks again and take care.